Uh, welcome everyone to, uh, to our SEAL conversation in February uh, 2019. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all. My name is Marcus Wagner. I'm one of the co-executive vice presidents uh, for the Society of International Economic Law. I uh, hope uh, you're all well. Um, the, before we get started with the formal proceedings, um, I have two quick uh, announcements. Uh, the first one is that we uh, have our next um, SEAL conversation scheduled for the 18th of March, 2021 uh, at, uh, at two o'clock uh, Brussels time, eight o'clock US, and we'll send out uh, emails again uh, for, for, close, um, for further details. The title for that conversation will be managed trade, health, and equitable access to medicines during a global pandemic, so very timely. Um, and the second uh, um, announcement is that uh, as we have done in, in months prior, this particular um, session or this particular um, uh, SEAL conversation will be uh, on our YouTube channel once uh, the, um, the event is closed and we'll, uh, we are um, encouraging you to sign up to that particular channel and we'll put that, um, we'll put the link into the Q&A box because that's the only way we have to communicate with our participants at this point. Now um, I'll pass over to Pasha who will introduce the speakers and then we'll get going. Thanks much. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Marcus. Um, uh, well, well, thank you all for joining the seventh um, SIEL conversation. Uh, we, our topic today is the RCEP agreement. Um, as Marco said, uh, my name is Pacha Xie, and I'm an associate professor at Singapore Management University School of Law. I'm very honored to moderate on today's session. We have four leading experts today, Dr. Deborah Elm, Executive Director um, of the Asian Trade Center, Professor Man Jiao Chi uh, from the University of International Business and Economic in Beijing, and Professor James Nedum Para from Jindal Global Law School and the Indian Institute of Foreign Trade, as well as Dr. Mira Buri, who is senior lecturer at the University of Luzerne, Switzerland. And I will first provide a short uh, overview of the RCEP and invite each speaker to address core issues about this mega FTA. After the presentations, uh, participants are welcome to ask questions. Please type your question into the Q&A box. Well, uh, in November 2020, 15 Asian Pacific countries concluded the RCEP, which is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, making the agreement uh, the world's uh, largest FTA in the world, um, the, the world's largest FTA. The RCEP's share of global GDP amounts to 30%. So the economic scale um, of the RCEP is comparable to that of the EU and the CPTPP combined. In terms of legal structure, uh, the RCEP is largely based on the so-called ASEAN plus one FTAs with countries such as China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. There may be some misunderstanding about the RCEP. Well, first, um, the RCEP has been portrayed as a China-dominated uh, trade pact. In fact, the RCEP was initiated and led by uh, the 10-country bloc ASEAN. Second, since the inception of the RCEP negotiation, in 2013, many commentators have categorized the RCEP as an FTA of low quality and ambition, uh, presumably because um, the RCEP does not have um, provisions on SOEs, ISDS, uh, investor state dispute settlement, labor and environmental protection. It's true that the RCEP um, uh, may be considered as a rule taker rather than a rule maker, but the rules that it adopts become uh, default rules for the Asia Pacific. In particular, the RCEP's consolidation of the rules of the region alone will result in significant benefit to Asian companies. And based on the experiences of ASEAN plus one FTA, it may be more accurate to uh, view the RCEP as an evolving process. Well, finally, um, the RCEP will help fill the gap, the FTA gap between RCEP members it may provide an important incentive for India to rejoin the RCEP. We should also know that the RCEP will coexist exist, uh, with current trade and investment agreements. In other words, the RCEP will not eliminate the so-called noodle bowl syndrome on a de jure basis. It may nonetheless, uh, nonetheless alleviate the trade fragmentation problem on a de facto basis if more exporters and importers 
choose to utilize the RCEP over existing PACs. So this is my short overview of this agreement. I will first invite uh, Deborah uh, to speak on important issues on tariff and service liberalization. Deborah, please. Thank you very much. So I'll try to be fairly brief about the benefits that come from RCEP in these two areas. So first on tariffs and trade in goods, I would say that RCEP com combines some useful tariff reductions, some tariff elimination. It depends on the markets that we're looking at between the 15 countries, how deep and how useful those uh, commitments will be in the short run, because we already have lots of existing trade agreements in the region. So the tariff concessions I think are okay. There could be better, but they will probably improve over time. But the key to me for trade in goods that is in RCEP that does make a transformative difference and is the reason why individuals and companies, governments from literally all around the world, and in the last 24 hours, I've been talking to the Germans, to the Canadians, et cetera, on this particular topic, uh, is because of the rules of origin that are contained in the agreement. So what our step does is it has one rule of origin. So once I manufacture a product like lotion for our step uh, distribution, I don't have to remanufacture it. I don't have to swap out any of the ingredients for content from within members because 15 countries, lots of ingredients. So I make it in Asia and then I can more easily transport it in and around uh, at lower tariffs for Asia. And that is something that is really new and is likely to set up supply chains in the region for final consumption and distribution in Asia. So we have lots of trade in Asia and goods, but it tends to be raw materials, parts and components, not finished goods. Now, with RCEP in place, once it comes into place about a year from now, we should see more consumption in Asia of Asian goods. That hasn't happened. And once you start to structure supply chains like that, it will be harder and harder for non-RCEP countries to contribute content and participate in supply chains in the region because they will just, by efficiency, they will get better and better in Asia. So I think on the trade and goods side, what RCEP does is it really restructures supply chains to be very Asian dominant. That has not happened before and is likely to be significant. On the trade and services side, services is interesting. We have had not very good coverage, I would say, of trade and services, despite lots of trade agreements in the region. Services always get the sort of short end of the stick partly because members are cautious about their own services, uh, also because the negotiators tend to be less confident about how to handle trade and services. So we just have very thin rules, I would say, across many of the markets for handling trade and services. RCEP on trade and services split does two things. On the one hand, it's useful because half of the members have agreed to move towards a new scheduling procedure called the negative list scheduling, where the, the base assumption is everything is opened for services unless I tell you otherwise. That is the new model of scheduling services that is increasingly being used. It is very helpful for firms. It's also very helpful for new services because they are automatically by default opened for uh, trade across the region. Uh, that's very useful. But half of the members chose to stick for the moment to the existing WTO GATT scheduling called positive list, which is I only open what I tell you is open and the, me the methods of delivery that I tell you are open are the only ones that are open. And so in the early stages of RCEP, this will be incredibly complicated for firms because they will have to try to understand two fundamentally different ways of looking at services and although I can, as a lawyer, and I'm sure the lawyers on this, this call will say, yeah, but I can make exactly the same commitments both ways. I can manipulate the, the format of this commitment so that it's identical. The reality for companies is that it is super complicated to have two separate approaches embedded into one agreement. And so for services trade, we have a lot more services trade overall more rules on services trade. We're pro prohibiting what I would call performance requirements for services, fantastic. But the market access and scheduling issue in RCEP is a mixed bag, where some of it I think is very helpful and forward-looking and some of it is more challenging. 
for firms. It's easier for governments, it's harder for firms. And so the net result on services is we will have more trade in the region of services. Services, everything from education to construction, to healthcare, to business services, et cetera. But the, the, it will be, continue to be very uneven, I think, in terms of, of usage of this agreement by companies in the region. So let me stop there. Uh, and I'm, again, I'm happy to talk about anything else RCEP related. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Deborah. And now um, I would like to invite Manjiao uh, to speak on investment issues as well as um, issues related to China. Manjiao, please. Thank you, Pasha, and thank you uh, to Seal for the kind invitation. Um, well, this is a very interesting uh, topic, and China is the biggest economy in the Asian Pacific region, and one of the biggest in the world. Uh, as Pasha already mentioned in the in the uh, very beginning, that uh, different from uh, what people generally uh, perceive, some of the people perceive uh, RCEP is not China-led agreement. It's actually surrounded to um, the ASEAN the uh, Southeast Asian nations. Um, but still, uh, China believes that uh, the conclusion of RCEP is at least a kind of diplomatic success to China. If you consider uh, the existing uh, treaties like uh, United States, Mexico, and Canada, and more importantly, CPTPP, uh, to which China is not a party. So uh, China believes this success would be a uh, underlining uh, success for uh, multilateralism. Uh, 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 unilateralism at this point of time. Uh, what China could benefit uh, most is that if we have a look at the landscape of FTAs with China, uh, we find that China has FTAs with uh, ASEAN countries um, back um, almost 20 years ago. China also has um, uh, FTAs with Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, the only country China does not have an FTA is Japan. So uh, this is very obvious that China could benefit from this uh, uh, FTA, um, RCEP, with um, uh, import and export from Japan. And so uh, is Japan. So these are the, the basic idea of what China would have um, from the uh, RCEP. Uh, but beyond China, I think it is also very um, interesting to keep an eye on what uh, I, I, I draw from uh, Deborah's uh, uh, remarks just now, uh, whether or not and to what extent uh, RCEP is helpful in uh, establishing a Asian identity in um, the international um, economic governance in the future. And then uh, talking uh, on the investment front, uh, I have to say that uh, my impression is that RCEP investment chapter seems to be an unfinished uh, pack. Um, there are some, of course, uh, some uh, interesting topics already there, but these topics are uh, not really unusual or not really advanced. I echo, um, to some extent, the criticisms on uh, RCIP. Uh, I mean, horizontally, it is a, an achievement, but uh, vertically, uh, if we discuss, let's say, uh, market liberalization, investment liberalization, market access, um, let's say, a sustainable development, and then we find that this treaty or the, the investment chapter is not that very uh, advanced. Uh, the investment chapter does not contain a mechanism of investor state dispute settlement, that's ISDS. On the contrary, if we have a look at the existing uh, BITs or other types of um, uh, treaties between China and others and among um, uh, ASEAN member states and other RCEP member states, uh, there are always um, a choice of uh, of uh, investment arbitration. Uh, but of course, according to RCEP uh, final provisions and relations with the existing uh, treaties, it is still possible uh, for investors of ASEAN member states to uh, resort to investment arbitration if the underlying uh, treaty uh, otherwise provide such a, a, a mechanism. Uh, but that brings um, about a very important and interesting uh, question that is the ISDS reform. 
And as we know, the RSDS reform um, uh, has been in process, especially under the chair of Ancitra Working Group 3. Um, China and other countries are uh, proposing their models, not in the explicit way. Some of the countries have already submitted their position uh, papers, uh, but still there are a lot uh, to see in the future how ISDS uh, reform would take place. And uh, uh, this truth, uh, this investment chapter of RCEP also provides that in the next few years, uh, the member states will negotiate on how to, to solve these kind of issues. So uh, we'll see uh, in the few years uh, what this ISDS issue will be solved. But in the meantime, if there is a need for ISDS, it is still possible that the existing uh, treaties would, uh, would otherwise provide a, a discourse. And finally, I would also uh, highlight two uh, uh, points with regard to investment uh, disciplines in RCIP. And first of all is that uh, it's lack of innovation, as I've already mentioned, especially with regard to sustainable development, uh, labor rights, um, the uh, environmental protection issues. But of course, uh, this is understandable if we consider the the. Uh, different development levels of the RCEP member states in this region. Um, so that is not surprising to a certain extent. Um, another issue is investment facilitation. Uh, there is a very clear provision in the RCEP investment chapter that deals with investment facilitation. And this provision is more, I would say, nominal than um, enforceable because it's uh, mostly a best efforts obligation. So member states of RCEP shall um, take efforts to uh, deal with these issues. Uh, the WTO is now in, uh, in the uh, process of negotiating a framework for investment facilitation and the RCEP members are uh, overlapping, of course, uh, WTO members. So uh, let's see in the future how uh, these RCEP member states would negotiate in the WTO and how the relationship between the WTO framework for investment facilitation and the investment governance in RCEP states or in the Asian Pacific. Uh, would be. So I think I should uh, uh, stop here, Pasha, back to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Manjal. So we have a participant who asked a question about India. So now we have James who, is, who will speak on um, the issues on India as well as taxation. James, please. So uh, thank you, Pasha. Thank you, um, Marcus. Thank you, everyone. Extremely delighted to be part of this panel. So when we think about India's uh, withdrawal from the RCEP discussions, uh, we, you have to also look at the background. So India had a bit of a, a looking policy. India negotiated an agreement with uh, Singapore way back in 2005, then with Korea in 2009, and also with uh, Japan in 2011. And subsequently, India had a free trade agreement with, uh, with the ASEAN countries as well. When you really look at why a country actually leaves a trade agreement, uh, that, there could be multiple reasons. One, according to the, uh, the policy makers, there may not be any tangible benefit by signing the agreement. The second is more of a perception because you have to sell the agreement to the domestic constituency as well. And in the context of India, uh, let me be absolutely clear. The, uh, the agreements that India signed with the ASEAN countries or maybe with the uh, Southeast Asian countries were not actually delivering according to India's expectation. Uh, India had a burgeoning trade deficit with all the countries. So in the context of the RCP, one major concern was, is it actually an agreement basically with China? And when we look at China, definitely China is India's very important trading partner. But India has around 55 to 60 billion dollars of trade deficit every year. And this has been going up for a fairly long period. So we know that in the context of any trade agreement, if the domestic constituency is affected or at least uh, perceptionally affected, there has to be some kind of a trade remedy mechanism. So uh, the one mechanism that India suggested during the ne negotiation was the auto trigger mechanism. So once the quantum of imports actually go beyond a particular level, then the duties will lapse back to the MFN rate. And also there were some issues with respect to the base year 
for uh, scheduling tariff reductions. On this point, to me, understanding India had a bit of a concern. But if you ask me the question, was it actually a concern enough for a country to withdraw from the agreement after negotiating for nearly seven years? So when we look at the trade agreements, there could be multiple uh, issues, in fact. So uh, the auto trigger can be one of the many issues. The trade deficit with China can be an issue. Deborah rightly pointed about the rules of origin issue. And this was one particular concern which India definitely had. Assuming that India uh, has a differential kind of a tariff system with China, and if the, RC if the RCEP has got some kind of a rules of origin, can the Chinese goods come through the other RCEP countries and enter into? So rules of origin and tariff differential were extremely important issues. And I think uh, there were some outstanding uh, you know, issues between India and China and other countries with respect to that. At the same time, let me also uh, indicate the point that you know, India is a huge country. It's a huge country with the different sensitivities. So one of the sensitivities was actually with respect to dairy products. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, India had agreements with all the ASEAN countries, 10 countries plus uh, Japan, uh, Malaysia, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, and Korea. With Australia and New Zealand, India was negotiating, but India hasn't signed an agreement so far. And dairy sector is an extremely important sector in India. So obviously, I think the domestic industry will be uh, sensitive about it. And there was also some kind of a feeling within the country that the free trade agreements were actually leading to some kind of a deindustrialization. Whether there is a truth in that, I think that is uh, something which has to be examined and verified. But this was definitely a concern. Then when we look at other issues, in fact, uh, all the speakers mentioned that uh, the, the RCP agreement is not a high ambition agreement. Uh, we know that there is at the moment some kind of uh, a moratorium maybe on ISDS or ISDS is not actually part of it right now. But one can't rule out ISDS becoming part of the RCP agreement in the future. And look at India's position. Until 2010, India did not have any kind of an ISDS case. Uh, India thought that ISDS is something that happens only to Latin American countries. But now India is actually in the top league of nations uh, who are respondents in ISDS claims. There are many disputes, even in the last one or two months, uh, three cases have been ruled against India, basically with respect to certain kind of a retrospective taxation. And another issue which India had was with respect to you know, direct taxes. So we know that in the case of a direct taxes, there is a, a minimum, uh, sorry, a mutually agreed procedure. And we have got negotiations happening in OECD and other forums as well. So, the, so in, uh, in areas like digital trade, when, you know, when uh, many uh, digital companies are actually providing services and making a profit from jurisdictions in which they have no uh, presence at all, it becomes an issue to open up some of the areas like digital services. So that is why, you know, in, some, in certain situations, once you sign a trade agreement, it is very difficult to get out of that. And India has been suffering, uh, especially in the context of the information technology agreement. India signed their agreement in 1997, assuming that India can actually be a leader in, in hardware exports. But, you know, I mean, if you look at the evidence in the last two decades, it hasn't actually worked to India's benefit. The same thing with agriculture agreement. When India signed uh, the agriculture agreement in 1994, India did not have even, uh, you know, uh, aggregate measurement of support, the amber box subsidy at that time. But look at the situation now. Many countries are actually raising complaints before the Committee on Agriculture that India is exceeding the de minimis support. So the point is that trade agreements can have consequences and you never know in what manner the technology will evolve in the future, especially with respect to electronic commerce, uh, data localization and server localization has been there in India, at least in an indirect manner. So, and there are specific provisions with respect to the data localization and uh, server localization within the electronic commerce chapter. So, I mean, there are many issues, but are these issues completely unresolvable? I do not think so. And definitely there is actually a door left for India. My feeling is that this is an issue where I think there has to be much more careful and considered decision. Of course, it has been two, two years, almost one and a half years since India withdrew from the agreement. But at, le at least I think there should be, there has to be, a, I think some kind of a reason for relook re at India's position as well. But I feel that uh, when compared to many other agreements like the, uh, the CPTPP or other agreements, RC uh, RCEP is actually a far better agreement for a country like India because of the fact that, you know, it is not too ambitious. 
So I would actually stop here. And if there are any questions, I would like to take it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, James. Um, so uh, if any participant have questions, uh, please type your question into the Q&A box. Now, uh, I would like to invite Mira to speak on uh, e-commerce issues as well as EU's positions on the RSF. Mira, please. Thanks so much, Pasha and Marcus for the invitation to speak as part of this uh, SEAL conversation. Delighted to be here and address the RCEP e-commerce chapter. Um, to understand a little bit of design and the impact of this chapter, it is important to put it into context against the backdrop on the one hand of the regulatory needs of the global driven economy that we have. And on the other hand, um, against the backdrop of the changing regulatory environment, in particular by looking at developments in other uh, FTAs with regard to digital trade and the discussions that we have, of course, also as part of the World Trade Organization on the topic. Just very, very briefly on the first issue, uh, we know this mantra of data being the new oil, of course, and this is not uh, necessarily a, a true statement because data is not uh, exhaustible as oil and its value may be actually lost over time. But it's just very illustrative of this uh, centrality of data that we have for modern economies and the push also uh, both uh, with governments and uh, companies to make, to make this um, uh, global driven economy uh, real, to make the best of it. Although, of course, here we have uh, major differences across different jurisdictions. Um, in the concept of trade policies, what uh, has become true, however, is that it seems that data must uh, cross borders. It must flow across borders. Uh, otherwise, a lot of the things that we are used to even in sort of everyday life, you know, like streaming services, uh, uh, the app economy uh, and buying things online may actually uh, not work. And if you think down the road about Internet of Things and artificial intelligence, uh, certainly uh, this could be a hindrance. At the same time, what we have also seen is this wish uh, by, by a lot of countries actually to protect their digital sovereignty. And this has been related to the emergence of new digital trade barriers. Here, of course, the key word that we often mention is the so-called data localization measures. With regard to the changing regulatory environment, again, very briefly, in the past two decades, what we have seen uh, is a great number of uh, PTAs that have become real venues for rulemaking in the area of digital trade. So we have a growing number of issues that are covered, a growing number of bindingness of the norms that we have in these agreements, and many of those relate also to this enabling data flows, which is uh, critical in this aspect. Uh, we have very comprehensive templates. Those were mentioned uh, already. So we have the CPTPP and the USMCA, which comes on top of it as a sort of a confirmation of the US position on these things. But it's also important that these templates has almost verbatim also diffused. So uh, almost all post CPTPP agreements, more than 10 of those literally copy the same language that we have under the CPTPP template. And of course, we also have um, even sort of farther reaching deals uh, talking about the digital uh, technology agreement between the US and Japan, and uh, more importantly, the DEPA uh, between Australia, Chile and New Zealand. Um, this is very critical for understanding the impact of RCEP, also because many of the RCEP signatories are uh, CPTPP and uh, also often uh, DEPA members as well. Uh, in terms of the developments under the WTO, we have, of course, the 2019 Joint Statement Initiative in a sort of a push to move, to move towards a plurilateral agreement on e-commerce, um, which started, of course, a process which started more than 20 years ago with the e-commerce uh, program. Um, however, um, there we see a lot of roadblocks, a lot of hindrances in this negotiation. On the one hand, we have the, this clash between the EU and the US position, which is known on privacy issues, but we also have the position of China, uh, which tries to interpret uh, uh, digital trade quite quite narrowly uh, and talks only of online trade in goods. Uh, this is reflected, this sort of uh, clashes and uh, hindrances are reflected in the leaked text that we have now from uh, December 2020. Uh, a somewhat positive uh, development in all this landscape, something that Pasha mentioned, has been actually the repositioning of the European Union on matters of digital trade. So now in the currently negotiated agreements with Australia, Tunisia 
and New Zealand for the first time actually, uh, and the EU has provisions on, on data flows, including a ban on localization measures. However, it is important to point out here that those are coupled, so these commitments are coupled with a very high standard of protection of privacy, endorsing uh, personal data protection as a fundamental human right, and including a number of safeguards, both a time uh, safeguard as well as sort of um, um, right to regulate, which is a really broader caveat in the EU agreements. So what does the RCEP against this backdrop really bring on the table? So overall, we have uh, chapter 12, which deals with uh, e-commerce. It is a very comprehensive chapter. It has 17 articles. It falls, however, short of the ambition of the CPTPP and the US MC, uh, MCA, but brings about still nonetheless quite significant changes to the regulatory environment and in particular, of course, to China's commitments in the area of digital trade. Uh, we can in general sort of uh, talk in a, when we look at an e-commerce chapter, we can divide the rules in two groups. So we have rules that sort of try to facilitate digital trade by basically cutting the red tape and giving more transparency, more legal certainty to businesses. And uh, on the other hand, we have a second group of rules that relate to this newer issues of the data-driven economy, so uh, with regard to data flows and data localization measures. The RCEP has provisions on, on both, so in both these categories, as it seeks to promote electronic commerce, uh, to prom promote also cooperation amongst the members, uh, and the scope uh, of the chapter, if one looks at it and compares it with other uh, agreements, it is quite uh, similar. It is that it has certain limitations with regards to government procurement and financial services, which is uh, again a typical characteristic of essentially all PTAs, and it gives priority to the chapters on trade and services and investment. With regard to the facilitation of trade, the RCEP has quite important provisions. Uh, for paperless trading, for electronic uh, uh, signatures, electronic contracts, uh, ban on customs duties for electronic transmission. So here we see a change to something that has been discussed for a long period of time, the WTO, and there is a general transparency obligation under Article 12. So uh, in light of this wish to create a, this enabling environment for digital trade, uh, it also has, however, quite soft norms, uh, on consumer protection and online personal information, as well as um, rules against spam. But this is uh, soft in comparison to softer in comparison to other uh, FTAs, and this is completed with some sort of cooperation norms uh, on cybersecurity, dialogue on e-commerce. But again, if you compare it to other F uh, FTAs, in particular the CPTPP, the language here is very thin, very uh, soft. Uh, with regard to the sort of the provisions, um, um, this first group, group of provisions on facilitating trade, if you compare the RCEP to the CPT, one can say that they're not necessarily radically different. With regard, however, to data flows and this uh, more sort of um, tricky questions, uh, we do have uh, some differences. If one compares the articles, they appear uh, sort of at first blush quite similar. There is similarity uh, in the language. Um, but there are important clarifications that are included in the RCEP that actually reduce, uh, substantially reduce uh, the impact of the RCEP. So although we have sort of commitments on um, um, data flows and uh, a ban on data localization measures, there is important language that is added, treaty language, that changes uh, the picture uh, substantially. So we have uh, a couple of footnotes, uh, for instance, with regard uh, to the um, ban on localization, which basically says that um, if there are any uh, legitimate uh, policy objectives, uh, they should be decided uh, by the implementing party. So it's a, a really in the competence of the uh, implementing party how it seeks to or would like to limit this. Uh, so the legitimacy uh, is really sort of self uh, judging. And uh, um, not this is, if this is not enough, there is an additional sort of clarification, which says that um, basically uh, a party can take any measures it considers necessary for the protections of the so-called essential security interest, which is a sort of a no, new term, very broad term, which is included in the RCEP. And uh, there is an additional clarification that such measures shall not be disputed by other parties. So you see here, 
the regulatory space, the policy space that is given to the RCEP uh, countries to actually include any sort of limitations now or later on with regard to both uh, data flows and uh, uh, the ban on localization is really huge and it uh, gives a lot of room uh, to the parties to change this. Um, so um, we see here also some differences if you compare to the uh, uh, SP into the CPTPP. Certainly, there is no norm that uh, uh, regards source code, uh, something that is now increasingly part of the EU agreements and uh, essentially all US agreements. And this is not uh, surprising because this norm uh, was actually introduced in those agreements very much as a reaction to what China was doing uh, at home to some to prevent some of uh, Chinese practices. Uh, so in some, one can say that we have the RCEP chapter, e-commerce chapter, it is built upon and imitates a little bit the CPTPP framework, which is not necessarily surprising as I said that we have some common members. Uh, uh, however, the RCEP adds and removes language in order to give its member states all the lew leeway really that they need to adopt restrictive measures to digital trade and data flows if they wish to do so. We can only presume of course that uh, uh, China is quite keen on, on sort of protecting its digital uh, realm from the outside world and behind it's behind this sort of a weakening uh, language in, in this terms, China really would not have to change much at home uh, um, because of the RCEP and because of what the commitments on uh, digital trade. Uh, this has implications also, of course, for the WTO, to the negotiations. If they lead to an agreement, it appears that such an agreement um, might very well imitate or be very similar to the RCEP e-commerce chapter. Um, that is not, it's quite thin, uh, it, it's some, um, some aspirational aspects in it, and it is not really addressing sort of this key cross-border uh, digital and data flows in an effective uh, manner. Uh, the language, the three language is still very much sort of a 20th century language, it's not necessarily moving sort of in a future-oriented manner towards this needs of the data-driven economy. And this, of course, means that uh, the FTA channel, these bilateral agreements between other members are likely to remain a channel to move forward on these more important issues, very much in imitation to what we have under the DEPA. Um, so this is what I had on the e-commerce chapters. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Mira. We got uh, many uh, exciting questions. Uh, so I, I would like to invite all uh, the panelists to look at his questions and answer this question. Um, uh, I just want to want to let all participants know if you wish to ask your questions anonymously, uh, you are uh, welcome to do so. Well, uh, first of all, um, uh, Professor uh, Peter Bonnebush and Dr. Uh, uh, Yuebing Yang asked question about this few resolution, uh, uh, this few settlement mechanism of the RCEP. Will the RCEP uh, will members actually use um, RCEP dispute settlement mechanism, or uh, will the scope of the application will be extended to other areas as well? So uh, this question is, uh, I would like to ask uh, Professor Man Jiao Chi, and uh, with, with, with respect to questions on um, services, uh, uh, the, the uh, positive enlisting approaches, and I would like to ask uh, Deborah. And also, um, Deborah, you have advised many companies on the RCEP issues. As you indicated, um, RCEP is very complicated in terms of its schedules. And based on your experience, what service and what goods do companies actually care about? And, and I will let um, Manjiao and Deborah answer this question first, and then I will go to uh, Mira and James. Manjiao, please. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, Pasha. Uh, uh, I just try to 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 uh, quickly answer the questions. First of all, with regard to um, the uh, omission of ISDS in RCEP, I think it's not uncommon nowadays to see uh, trade agreements to drop ISDS in one way or another. We see that in uh, uh, USMCA, and we see that in uh, EU. Um, uh, 
uh, treaties and also uh, the recent China EU uh, treaty on investment. Um, uh, so um, I, I think this issue is not necessarily connected with the uh, ISDS reform, but they could be connected. One way uh, is that um, member states might want to wait, uh, or at least to see how ISDS reform would develop in the future uh, to decide what kind of mechanism they would want to have uh, for settling investment disputes. And the other is that some of the countries, um, as we can find uh, during the the ISDS reform, they have changed or they have their own position with regard to ISDS and then they probably no longer like ISDS anymore uh, or uh, have uh, shown less interest in ISDS. So this is also possible that they do not have this ISDS. But uh, more broadly, um, I, I would think that there is a, an emerging trend that uh, in today's um, uh, investment treaty making, uh, countries are more um, uh, focused on um, other aspects of investment, um, uh, facilitation, investment creation, or some liberalization, uh, but dispute settlement, especially the privatized uh, arbitration uh, is, um, I wouldn't say losing momentum, but is not as influential as in the past years. So with regard to Professor uh, Vandenbosch's question, um, uh, member states uh, uh, do, uh, the parties will have recourse to dispute settlement uh, system uh, over time, uh, the scope will extend it to subject matters currently excluded. I think it is, um, there is such a possibility and currently our RCEP only provides a state state uh, uh, dispute settlement. Uh, and in the same time, uh, RCEP does not ban uh, member states to choose other forums. So it is possible that they make uh, these kind of choice. I think it could create certain kind of pressure. Uh, on other mechanisms, if RCEP is dealing with this, that is more satisfactory to its member states, and then it could be a way um, as a leverage um, to be expanded uh, to other subject matters. But again, uh, we notice the uh, the uh, affirmative uh, uh, terms in the RCEP um, uh, um, uh, treaty and it says the uh, measures under uh, the agreement and therefore um, uh, to subject matters, I, I would say it depends on the, the member states uh, in the future, how they would be extended uh, to subject other uh, subject matters currently excluded, uh, especially uh, I think a close eye should be turned to uh, the RCEP joint committee uh, in the future. So I hope that answers. Pasha, back to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Manjel. Uh, Professor Yuk, uh, Yuka Fukunaga also raised a question. Uh, we say RCEP is an evolving agreement. What, what, what would it be? Okay, um, so Deborah, um, please. Sure, so I'm happy to answer that. I mean, I think most people should, should see RCEP as the current baseline. So it starts with that agreement as it's negotiated, but it will evolve over time in many ways. And I suspect it will deepen and broaden the dispute settlement mechanism, state to state dispute settlement mechanism could be extended to other areas of the agreement. I expect that you will have some concessions brought forward. So tariff cuts right now run for 20 years. I expect that many of them will actually be brought forward. And the reason that I expect this is the institutional structure of RCEP is unique, a, a bit unique in that it, it models ASEAN. We will have a secretariat coming for RCEP. It's the very first task of the joint committee. We will have regular set scheduled sessions for officials. They will lead to ministerial meetings every year, which will lead to a leader summit. And those of you, if, if anyone's been involved in, in trade uh, discussions uh, of this sort in ASEAN, you know that you cannot go to your minister and ask your minister to go to a summit without something. A minister has to have some kind of deliverable. They have to have something to sign, something to discuss, some work plan to implement something so that they then can turn around and hand it to the leaders and say, here's what we've done in RCEP this year. So there will be in RCEP, I think, a, a platform and a cadence that develops just like in ASEAN where you continue to add new issues to the agenda, you continue to broaden, deepen, et cetera. So I think there will be a lot of changes on the RCEP side in institutional structure, in where dispute settlement, state-to-state -state dispute settlement works, in the development of a mechanism to handle investor state issues, in the addition of better benefits on tariffs, for example, 
in the switch on services. So I had mentioned that half of the countries went positive list and half went negative list. The, the agreement itself has an inbuilt agenda to switch everybody's list to negative listing. So that will have to be managed. So in short, the, the RCEP as it exists or as it exists as it comes into force next year will have a sort of base and then it will increase and then expand and so forth over time, I suspect. Um, and so we should be thinking of it as the uh, entry position and hopefully things will improve in areas like, please help us e-commerce because the e-commerce provisions are wretched. I mean, frankly, they are awful. What is the point of signing up to an agreement that says data should flow unless I decide otherwise and nobody gets to argue with me when I decide otherwise? Like, what is the point of that? I don't know. So, so I think some of those um, uh, provisions that are in there that are weak or worse, maybe get tightened and, and we end up with a better agreement over time. I, and, and I think that is the promise of the RCEP and the reason why it's worth paying attention to it. It's not just what it gives you today, but what it gives you in the future. And then I forgot the other question you asked me, something about how do, what are firms looking for for benefits? Firms are looking for a lot of things, frankly. Uh, you know, company, it is harder than you imagine to move goods around uh, Asia. So RCEP is supposed to help us move goods around better faster, easier, cheaper, with lower tariffs. It's supposed to help us address some of the non-tariff issues, which are horrible and difficult. Uh, it's supposed to bring about greater consistency, greater clarity. For me, one of the big benefits of RCEP as well is a series of what I would call performance requirement restrictions for goods, for services, and for investment that say, you may not require the following kinds of things. You may not require certain kinds of investment vehicles. You may not require only so many bank branches. You may not limit X, Y, and Z. So there's a lot of things in there that I think are very helpful. Uh, that's what firms are looking for. Better clarity, more consistency, uh, better deliverables, so that trade ends up being freed in the region for companies that want to take advantage of it. Well, thank you very much, Debra. Uh, we have several questions on data localization um, um, uh, raised by uh, Ini and uh, Vinika, Vinitika. Um, Mira, would you like to answer these questions? Sure, yeah. Um, um, thanks, Ines, for the question. I think uh, uh, it is a great question and very relevant. I actually agree with you that in saying that, uh, although we have these commitments with regard to um, data flows and the ban on localization, uh, their impact is substantially undermined by, by this very broad exceptions that we have. Um, um, so um, not only do we have these exceptions, but as I mentioned before, they are not sort of linked to any sort of a uh, dispute settlement or any sort of a transparency mechanism. So it does state the party, the RCEP party basically self-judging on deciding whether it should implement any sort of restrictions to the free flow of data or uh, including data localization bans. And there is no possibility to, uh, to dispute any of those decisions. So uh, this is really uh, plenty of uh, policy space for this RCEP members. Um, and it's uh, really uh, uh, intransparent, which of course, I guess was the only way to include uh, China in, in this uh, uh, e-commerce chapter and the commitments that we have under it. Um, but it is- Sorry, can I interrupt right there? Just to say, this was not China that did this. This was ASEAN. Before we, we can blame China for many things, but those data flow requirement problems was not a Chinese decision. That was an ASEAN decision. Well, well um, it depends uh, how you view it because this essential security interests uh, exception is precisely the same that China included also uh, in the WTO negotiation and it's part now of the pro-lateral agreement and negotiation text. So we do have a lot of similarities and I, I believe this- Yes, but uh, Vietnam has this, a cybersecurity law as well. That looks yes. very similar. And so I think, I mean, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to throw China under the bus on a lot of things, but on this, the, the actual negotiation of this one was not China. There was a lot of problems with China. This was not it. No, but yes, the terminology and the way it was yes. pushed for it, this, uh, essential security interests, I, I do think that was China. That, that really included this language and it's the same language that it has in the WTO negotiations. And I, I, indeed, I agreed also with Ines what, what she's saying basically that this is a sort of a, a going back on a lot of the other commitments that we have in other PTAs. And it's not really moving forward on this sort of 
addressing the needs of the data-driven economy. Um, also, what is surprising is that if you compare to uh, other exceptions that we have in PTAs, there is no language on sort of uh, uh, making link to the WTO, to the Article 20, to the Article 14 of the GATS. So this general exception clauses that we have, um, there is no language that they can be applied mutatis mutandis under the RCEP. Uh, which is uh, unusual. We do have uh, most of this language in other agreements. Um, so yeah, overall, it's, it's not necessarily a positive de development, but I, I guess that was the only way uh, moving forward on this politically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we indeed that uh, we have many uh, issues uh, related to China. So I think it's time to ask an Indian expert, James. Okay, uh, James, you mentioned the reason why uh, India decided to withdraw from the RCEP. I, I think here a more fundamental question for you is this, how do we bring India back to the table? Um, if, if you wish to advise uh, as, uh, current RCEP members. Uh, thank you, Pastor. I think um, that is a very difficult question. Uh, first of all, I think India has vaguely articulated the concerns which India had for withdrawing from the agreement. So I think uh, there are multiple issues, in fact, and in my opinion, it requires a, a longer uh, engagement with uh, uh, most of the RCEP countries. It cannot be decided all of a sudden. And some of the issues can also be to an extent bilateral. So I spoke about uh, the huge trade deficit with China. This is actually a bilateral issue. And Sometimes you know, there is also a feeling in India that uh, despite the signing of the agreement, it is very difficult to get market access uh, in, in China or also in some of the ASEAN countries. I would also like to mention one point here. So when we think about India, India's major advantage is actually uh, skilled service professionals or maybe uh, people who are educated, who can work in multiple professions. But when it comes to the services negotiation, I think this point was very clearly mentioned by most of the panelists, in, in particular by Deborah, that the services part is extremely, I think, lukewarm. It is not ambitious at all. And it is to an extent uh, only reiterating the commitments within the uh, WTO, not undertaking any more commitments. And most of the countries have also adopted the positive list approach. So because of these reasons, India cannot actually uh, seek to benefit significantly in the area of services where it has got a comparative advantage. To a, uh, to, to a large extent, the RCP agreement is a good agreement, and that is precisely India's concern. So I hope that some of these issues will require a longer consideration, but I think it will be in the interest of RCP if India can also join it. So it is in the, in the interest of both the, I mean, the entire RCP membership and also India to seek better engagement and understanding of the concerns of each, each group. Well, thank you very much, James. Uh, we also got an excellent question about uh, the future of, uh, uh, of RCEP membership. Um, which country will be the next RCEP members? Uh, may I invite panelists to answer this question? Manjal, please. You, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry, sorry, uh, Pasha. I, I think it's really difficult to, to answer which will be the next one. Um, but I, I, I think both uh, practically and theoretically, it is possible for RCEP to uh, have new uh, countries joining. So that is possible. Um, I'm not sure whether uh, India would be the next one because uh, since Indian pull out, pull out um, uh, the members of the RCEP still keep the back door for, for India. So it makes India easier than other uh, uh, countries to join. Um, but I, I would think that it, it, over time, it is probably also possible um, uh, that some of the CPTPP um, um, uh, countries uh, would consider um, uh, join um, uh, the um, uh, RCEP in order to a kind of level playground between uh, CPTPP and the R RCEP. So that's my guess. Pasha, mm -hmm. thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jiao. Um, and all ASEAN uh, members are ASEAN plus one FT, uh, ASEAN plus one FTA partner. So, uh, so based on the rationale, Hong Kong may be the next one. Okay, uh, Deborah. Yeah, I would say Hong Kong. 
Taiwan, I'm sure, not that they're looking at it now, but at some point Taiwan would need to be in one or the other or both of these regional agreements. The problem for the bigger players that might otherwise be interested in RCEP is the missing chapters. So the Europeans, for example, will not come into an agreement that does not have environment and labor, and certainly not right now. The Americans would have a very hard time joining RCEP because the standards are not high enough. Uh, and so I think expansion of RCEP will take place for countries that would be leveling up to RCEP rather than countries that would be stepping back to an RCEP level. And I think that will limit to a certain extent who may join, but it also may be other countries. I would think South Asia would be very interested, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, et cetera, because they are also going to be suffering from RCEP integration uh, and looking for ways to mitigate that. So I could imagine, again, it hasn't been discussed yet, it's too early, uh, but I could imagine some South Asian members looking for another place to, to be part of a, a supply chain and integrated supply chains uh, for goods and then for services as well. Uh, so I would say South Asia could be interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, uh, Deborah. Uh, Mira, you explained e-commerce provisions in uh, quite detail. So I have a question for you. Um, in your view, um, will um, the European, the EU agreement with um, ASEAN countries, Singapore, uh, Vietnam, or uh, Singapore's recent DEA, Digital Economic Agreement, can serve as a model for um, uh, the future of the RCEP? What's your view? Indeed, I agree. I agree. And this is uh, very much also sort of uh, in light of the current strategy of the European Union to sort of um, expand uh, this uh, e-commerce chapters. However, as I mentioned before, we should not forget this, this uh, additional safeguards that now the EU would always like to have in its, in its uh, free trade agreements that I mentioned before on the protection of privacy as a fundamental right and including this right to regulate as an additional provision. And we have this now with, uh, with Australia, New Zealand and Chile, as well as in the Brexit agreement with, uh, with the United Kingdom. So, but I do agree that this could be a very, very useful model. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mira. Um, James, I also have a final question for you. Um, you mentioned that RCEP uh, um, is, is considered a better deal uh, for India uh, because it doesn't have very high uh, standards. Uh, when we talk about FTA, we also uh, emphasize a lot, uh, put a lot of uh, pay a lot of attention to FTA's development provisions or provisions on economic cooperations. Do you think these provisions um, in the RCEP will be useful for India? Yeah, I mean, uh, the way I understand economic cooperation, these kind of provisions are not actually uh, subject to dispute settlement provisions. They are in a way, I think. Um, good for you know with the members of the rcap and also for uh, countries that would like to join the rcap agreement to basically enhance their capacity in multiple areas uh just one point i was uh, talking about the south asian countries i try i i mean my own feeling is that south asia is quite different very distinct from the southeast asian countries so india is actually one among the the more developed uh, south asian country so if India can actually uh, find major difficulty in joining the, the RCP agreement, then I anticipate that the other South Asian countries will find it even more difficult. So that, there are many areas where I think South Asian countries actually require uh, handholding because of the huge amount of uh, poverty in some of the countries. And of course, uh, South Asia has to really <clears throat> catch up in multiple areas. So uh, economic cooperation and uh, development initiatives can be extremely useful. And I think this is one area where the RCP can definitely contribute. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, James. Uh, Professor Roland Bosch also raised a very important question on the accession process, whether or not decisions on accession will need consensus among current RCEP members. I think if we look at the provision, I think the answer is yes. Um, um, Deborah, do you, have, do you have anything to add? I don't think they've thought this one through. It's a little like the TPP, the CPTPP did, is they, they knew they wanted to have an accession clause, but it wasn't until it was done and entered into force that they began to start fleshing out uh, what that looks like, what the procedures are. So if you look at CPTPP, under the commission, 
they have now issued a couple of different revisions to mm. the accession part of CPTPP. Mm. I assume the same thing will happen on RCEP. So they will start with a sort of blanket statement. Agreement is open to new members in 18 months. Uh, and then as we get closer to the 18 month deadline and or someone says we want to be in, then they will sit down and try to figure out what that accession clause looks like. And I think mm -hmm. the hope by the current members is that the secretariat will be taking the lead in driving that discussion around accession so that the secretariat would serve as a sort of mediating force and the, the sort of institutional structure to manage an accession procedure. Uh, and so I, I think you need to watch this space in short. Mm -hmm. So you used to have to have, as Pasha notes, you used to have to have an ASEAN plus one agreement to get in. I think that is likely to be formally broken from accession once it starts, but I don't think anyone wanted to say so now. So they just mm -hmm. said, we will do it in 18 months and watch this space. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Deborah. Uh, we had a very rich discussion today. So we come to the end uh, of the session and I would like to thank all the speakers and participants and I would also like to thank support from SIEL colleagues, including our president, uh, Professor Peter von der Bush, uh, Vice President uh, Isabel von Dam and Marcus Wagner, as well as Maria Laura Macedu. We look forward to meeting you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.